All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Amphitheater Hot Shop here at the Corning Museum of Glass. Uh, my name is Eric Goldschmidt. I'm the, the Flameworking and Properties of Glass Supervisor here at the museum. And uh, very happy to welcome you all to a very special program that we have going on this week. Uh, we have a few guest artists here in the amphitheater with us. Now, typically in this space, what you tend to see are furnace-style glass-blowing demos. Uh, we've got a bunch of big ovens behind me. Uh, you typically see our team making things like bowls, vases, sculpture, goblets, all sorts of things out of, out of our ovens. But this week, we have a, a special program that involves flameworking. And uh, flameworking is a style of glass blowing where rather than using big furnaces, the artists use more focused heat sources. And nowadays, those heat sources are torches that run on, in this case, propane and oxygen. And uh, I want to introduce our guest artists. We have a few artists in from out of town. Uh, to my left here is Adam Hubri who has come out to visit us from Los Angeles. Uh, in the middle bench here, we have Dan Coyle, who has, <laughs> who has come out from Massachusetts. And uh, on the, the far bench over here is Ryan O'Keefe, who has also come out from California, from the, the San Diego area. And these gentlemen are quite renowned in their craft. Uh, they are brilliant flame workers who tend to focus their efforts on making pipes, uh, pipes for, for cannabis use. And what they are working on this week is a collaborative piece. Uh, they have been working on the piece the entire week. We got them started on Monday. And uh, here we are Thursday. They still have quite a bit of work to go. Uh, they are working on a piece that is sort of a, a robot or a mechanoid form. And we can show you uh, the, the sketch that they, they came out here with, if we can pick that up on our cameras. So they came with sort of a, a rough sketch of a, a mechanoid robot that they had in mind. And uh, again, they've been working on this all week. So this gives a, a rough idea of where they're headed with this piece. But these guys have been adding some amazing details to the work as we've gone along here. And the way a, a work session like this goes is a little different than our, our, our typical demonstrations around here. Uh, typically, you're going to see the beginning of the process, and an hour and a half later, through the course of the live stream, you would see a, a finished piece. What they're working on takes dozens of hours. And uh, what, what really adds time is adding detail to an object. So these guys are working on some of the different components to the robot. Uh, right now, Adam is working on one of the arms. And uh, looks like Ryan is also working on some of the uh, sort of cylinder components that would move the arms around. Now, this isn't actually a kinetic sculpture. It won't actually move. Uh, but they've got all the different details you might want to add that would show how that, that robot might actually function. And in addition to this being a robot sculpture, as I mentioned, it's actually a functional water pipe as well. So these guys have been able to incorporate uh, functional items into a brilliant sculpture. Now, you're going to notice through the, the course of things here, there, there's some interesting pacing going on. They have several components to the piece and the different ovens that are to either side of the workspace here. The ovens are crucial components as well. As glass is heated, it swells or expands a little bit. And then as it cools, it'll contract or, or shrink. So if a piece of glass is heated too unevenly or too quickly, different areas expand and contract at such different rates, they can end up pulling apart and cracking. So that is always a, a key point that's in the back of their minds as they're working. So we keep components warm in the ovens. The ovens are holding at 1,050 Fahrenheit. That's warm enough they can take the piece directly out of the oven, like Ryan is doing right now, put it directly into that 4,000 degree flame and not have to worry about it. But 1,050 is not hot enough to soften this glass. So nothing's going to change shape while it's sitting in the ovens. And I mentioned these guys have been at this all week and uh, actually Adam and Ryan did quite a bit of prep work before coming out here. They prepared a, a whole bunch of the colored glass that you see these guys working with. 
and uh, Dan did a, a bit of prep work as well. He was teaching in our studio facility last week, teaching a, a class in this uh, incredible uh, bit of, of sculptural work. And uh, so he did a, a little bit of prep work during that class as well. And as I mentioned, these guys have amazing reputations in their, their field. They're some of the, the top artists out there. And uh, if you've been following along with a lot of the programming we've been doing here at the museum over the last few years, uh, you may know that the, the museum is really embracing what's going on in this pipe movement, which is uh, a, really a, a very important movement in the world of glass, particularly in the world of flameworked glass. But uh, we are seeing some of the biggest innovation in the world uh, of glass and in the world of flameworking with sort of some of these really innovative pipe makers. And uh, we're really seeing that driven to, to the extremes with what these guys are up to here. So uh, I noticed in our class catalog back in the fall that Dan would be out here teaching. And uh, oftentimes when we have different instructors come from far away, we offer them the opportunity to demonstrate for a few days in front of our, our museum audiences here in the amphitheater. And as Dan and I were talking about having him uh, do a, a guest artist, stint here, uh, we talked about the idea of a collaborative piece. Uh, I've seen uh, a bunch of work online that these three guys have made together, uh, also made with other artists and in incorporated in some of their works, and we could not be happier to have all three of these guys out here working together. Uh, bringing these three artists together raises the potential of, of what can be made by any one of the three individually, and uh, they are absolutely taking it to another level here. So we'll introduce you to some of the materials these guys are using. I, I mentioned they prepared a, a whole bunch of color before they came out here. So uh, you, you're seeing some of the colored glass they're working with as, as they're working it. Now, the colored glass they started with all starts in rod form, uh, like what I've got in my right hand here. And this is some of the yellow glass they're working with. Uh, so with this glass, they can stripe it over tubes of clear glass to create colored tubes of glass. Uh, that's what I've got in my left hand here. They'll also stripe these colors over solid rods to get solid components to, to sculpt with. Now, this yellow glass, when it's really hot, looks orangey. And you can see uh, with some of what uh, Adam's working with here, some of it is starting to cool down and come back to that original yellow. Now, the orange glass that they're working with, when this stuff is really hot, it looks almost reddish or sort of a, a dull reddish orange. As it cools, it will come back to a, a really bright orange again as well. So they did quite a bit of prep work before coming here. Now, these bright oranges and yellows are actually very finicky colors. Colored glasses are created by adding different metal oxides and different elements from the Earth's crust in with the ingredients for clear glass. And when all those materials are heated to the right temperature for the right amount of time, there is a bit of a chemical reaction that occurs and we wind up with colored glass that way. Different colored glasses behave differently. Uh, some have different viscosities. Some will be really soft while at the same temperature, uh, another colored glass might be really stiff. Uh, some colored glasses, if they're not heated just right in the right part of the flame and the flame isn't set just right, they might actually start to boil and bubble or they may discolor. So these yellows and oranges are very finicky colors. They tend to be very stiff. They also will tend to boil and bubble if you're not working them just right. So these guys have uh, taken a, a very smart step and put a layer of clear glass over those finicky colored glasses. And that is gonna help to make them more stable. They'll be far less likely to boil and bubble and uh, work a lot more consistently for them. Now, uh, I mentioned you're gonna see some, some different sort of pacing going on here than what we typically see in our, our glass demonstrations at the museum. So these guys are building different components that are gonna then be attached to the, the major composition. Now, uh, what Ryan is putting away in the oven right now and what Adam has been working on down here, those are arms to our robot. To build these arms with all the details, 
they've created separate details that they then apply to the arms. Once those arms are built up and finished, they will attach them to the, the bigger composition. So as they go along here, they'll, they'll continue to work on individual components, and then there'll be different times they'll pull out that bigger sculpture and make these bigger attachments. Did you have a question? What color is coil working with? That is a gun mount black that is sort of a, a graphite gray, even will get some greenish tones to it. Uh, it is not something that is available on the market. That is actually a, a colored glass that Corning Incorporated used to make. They uh, use them to hold cathode ray tubes in old TVs, and uh, they actually made them different colors to specify what company or what TV they were meant to go to. And they happen to be outstanding colored glasses to work with. Uh, that, that was not the intent when they were originally made. Uh, we've been able to acquire some here and there through the years. They no longer use them. They don't make cathode ray TV tubes anymore. Uh, but they, uh, they can be applied to sculptural work. So yeah, that, that is what that colored glass is there. So Dan's sort of building up a thicker mass of the colored glass by striping that over clear glass. And what Adam's up to here, he's sort of building some sort of shielding over the, the shoulder of this, this arm here. And to make attachments, that's a, another crucial thing that we're gonna see a lot of as these guys go along here. They're attaching multiple parts together. There are two really important factors as they make attachments. One is temperature, the other is shape or sort of angles. So first of all, they have to make sure the glass gets hot enough to really flow and fuse together if they want it attached permanently. So they judge that by watching the, the glow of the glass. The hotter the glass is, the brighter it's gonna glow. And as they're making these attachments, they're making sure that glass is heated so it really flows together. And then as far as shapes and angles, we don't want to leave really sharp, acute angles where different parts come together. Really sharp, acute angles will not hold together for long. As the glass cools, those are going to pop apart. And when they pop apart, oftentimes that cracking will send a crack through other, other areas of the piece. So you're going to notice uh, they have a, a lot of tools to be able to adjust these attachments. And with a big composition like what they're working on, every little attachment matters. The last thing in the world they want is to not spend a few extra seconds melting in an attachment, getting the angle just right, and having that break further on down the line. So that will be a very important component as we go along here. And part of what they need to do, they sort of make attachments, make sure the attachments are, are really welded properly, and then they can sort of adjust the shapes from there. So that's what you see Adam sort of working on here. He got another one of those panels attached, and he's just, just sort of rounding it out over the, uh, the shoulder area here. And Dan, what are, what are you working on here? I'm trying to make something for the other shoulder. Gotcha. Maybe like more of those little mini guns. Excellent. All right, so they have been sort of dreaming up new details as they've been going along here. And uh, Dan is going to be working on some more, uh, more guns to go onto the robot. And as these guys get some of these other uh, components done, then they're going to be bringing out the, the big piece. They'll set it right on the table here uh, on Adam's station as they make these major attachments. And uh, so... The, the way the pace goes, there's a lot of sort of relaxed, steady work for a bit. Then they get ready to make a, a big attachment to the, the, the main composition. Things get pretty intense when that happens. Uh, at those moments, that piece really can't be out of the oven for very long, maybe five minutes to 10 minutes or so. Then they've got to get it back in the oven because it's starting to cool too severely. So you'll, you'll see some relaxed moments as these guys are building the different components, and then as we go to uh, assemble them onto the, the bigger structure, uh, then things get extra intense. You'll see all three of them working together around that, uh, that bigger composition. Now, I did mention these guys have been at this uh, all week, 
so clearly not everybody could catch all the, all the different parts of the process. And as we go through the, the program this afternoon, uh, as, uh, if we hit a, a quiet moment, I'll bring up a PowerPoint. We'll show you some images of some earlier stages throughout the week. And uh, this has just been a, a fascinating process. If you're curious to see some of these guys' other work, I'd highly suggest giving them a, a follow on Instagram. Uh, Adam is at Hoobs Glass, H-O-O-B-S Glass. Dan is at Coil Condenser. And Ryan is at SD Rhino. These guys make incredible work. And you'll, you'll see some amazing things in their, their Instagram uh, files as well. So getting these details all set up here. And uh, this is a, a really exciting moment in the, the world of flame working and, and the, the pipe scene in particular. Really starting to see uh, the game being changed and, and a whole lot of innovation in the, the level of work that's being made, the quality of work that's being made. And uh, it's, it's an interesting time. These guys are able to make work where they're spending a week on it these days because there's now a collector base that, that can really understand the, the value of such work and really understand what goes into it. And with the growth of the collector base, we're seeing new colored glasses come on the market. We're seeing new tools come on the market. And it just seems as though the, the whole game is just elevating faster and faster as we go here. So they're getting ready to uh, make one of those big moves. Uh, you saw Adam was just warming up the graphite plate on his workbench there. They want that warm. So when they put the hot piece of glass on there, it's not going right onto a cold surface that would suck heat out of the glass quickly and could potentially cause it to crack. So they warm up that work surface, get some uh, insulated gloves on so they can get close to the piece, and they're going to pull it out of this oven that's right next to me here in a moment. So they get their hand torches ready. give you your first good look at the composition here. And this piece has already gotten quite heavy. The, the legs are all constructed from solid chunks of glass and solid panels of glass. There are hollow forms uh, on the inside. If we can get a shot right inside, you can see our monkey pilot in there. Uh, Dan has a, a reputation for making a, a lot of interesting monkeys. And uh, so these guys decided the monkey as a pilot for the, the mechanoid robot would be a great move. Now, all the, the clear glass rods and tubes that you see around the piece are really there for support while they're working on it. So as the, the piece gets finished, they'll be removing all that clear glass. We see uh, one chunk of it coming right off of there. And the area they're working on here is actually part of the, the functional part of this object. That's some of the, the hollow tubing there that water will be able to run through, water and air and smoke and, and vapor. And just sort of cleaning things up down the bottom there, removing extraneous glass. They had left a little bit of extra clear glass in that area. It, it really helped to sort of balance things as they were attaching the legs on. But now that the legs are on there, that can be removed. And as I mentioned, they, they have a, just a short period of time they can keep this composition out of the oven. And uh, the, the color palette that they're using for this is actually really helpful for an object to be worked this way. The yellow looks orangey when it's nice and hot, sort of a dull, opaque orange. But as that cools, the yellow comes back in. So it gives them a pretty good uh, visual indicator as to what the temperature is like throughout the piece. So they've uh, sort of trimmed down some of the hollow tube that was coming off of there. Now they're trying to neaten up the shape on it. Dan has a blow hose connected to the top of the tubing here, so he can blow in and inflate that hollow form to get it shaped nice and neatly here. 
And one thing I've been noticing watching these guys work together all week, they are an incredible team. There, there's uh, just a, an innate trust in each other, that they know what each other are capable of, they, they know the level of commitment that they all have in this piece, they know their different skill sets very well, and uh, they really sort of have worked as a very cohesive team throughout this. It has been really impressive. Uh, Adam, a, a big part of his skill set that he brings to the table here is really a, a good understanding of how to build such complex constructions. Dan is particularly adept with the hollow work. He actually has uh, an education in scientific glass blowing. He, he studied to uh, learn how to make scientific labware, which really plays into all the hollow forms that are involved here. Ryan is a brilliant sculptor. He also has sort of the, the breadth of skills with the hollow forms and the structural concerns. So these guys are just a, a brilliant team to, to all be working together. And it has been so much fun to, to watch this all come together here. So yeah, that, that gives you a, a pretty solid idea of some of the pacing of how things go with this object at this point. So lots of parts that they'll continue to work on some of the smaller details. And then every once in a while, once that piece is warm enough and they've got another piece to attach to it or uh, another little edit to make to that composition, they'll pull the piece out of the oven, work on it at the bench here. And uh, again, they always have sort of that clock in the back of their heads knowing, okay, we've got to finish this move, get the piece back in the oven, get it to warm back up, soak that heat back in, then they can make another big move with it. Uh, another thing you're going to see as these guys go along are a lot of design decisions and de design discussions that go on. Uh, throughout the, the course of the week here, there have been uh, several times where they'll sort of bring the piece out, set it out on the table, get the sketchbook out, and really sort of uh, break down their, their next moves, break down what the next few details need to be, and then continue with the, the, the sculpting from there. Looks like we have questions coming in from our audience on the web here. Yeah, ah, okay. A question from the web. How big is the, the blow tube that's coming off the top of the piece? That is a 19 millimeter heavy wall tubing. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. They've stepped it up. Sorry. It's, uh, it is 26 mil heavy wall tubing. So, yeah. Big piece of tubing for a big piece of glass. Uh, as they were sort of working on that thing last night, uh, they had, it was 19 mil on there yesterday, and it got tougher and tougher for them to turn and to really be able to torque the piece. So putting a, an even larger tube on there makes it a little more manageable. All right, so it looks like Ryan's plugging away on Another one of the arm series been adding these different piston and sort of hydraulic looking components. Uh, I, I had some sense that this was going to be a, a pretty amazing piece before these guys even came out here, but to, to watch this thing evolve the way it has over the course of the week has just been uh, absolutely mind blowing. So each day throughout the week, we've started around. 10 a.m. with the actual glass working, but these guys get in around 9. We take a look at the different components and, and what the, the day's work will entail, get the different components into the ovens, warm those ovens up for an hour or two till they get up to 1,050, and uh, then they really dive right in and, and have been cranking away until about 6.30 at night each night. And uh, then in the morning, I, I've been getting in a few minutes before they have, and I, I pop the ovens open and it is just a, a sight to behold each morning to, to see how this thing continues to progress. So see Ryan using a, the combination of torches here. These little hand torches these guys use, you didn't see them very often around Flameworking Studios until maybe 15 years ago or so. You started to see more and more of these and now they're an absolute staple in, uh, in the Flameworkers Studio. And they've really sort of opened up a, a level of detail work that you didn't quite see so much of in, in years past. So these, these torches are really 
crucial for finding out these, these tight attachments in small spaces. They provide a lot of heat in a, a very tiny spot. So even with that little tiny flame there, it's still well over 3,000 Fahrenheit. And uh, what Ryan's doing is really sort of cleaning up so, some of those angles. I, I mentioned how acute angles will be a problem. So if you do see an angle that looks a little bit sharp and acute, you get in there with that really hot little needle of, uh, of flame there, and that will soften the glass, smooth it in, and then uh, it'll be structurally sound from there. Now, you're going to notice these guys changing flames every once in a while, too. Uh, when the flame is a bright blue, that is a, a flame that has quite a bit of gas and oxygen mixed in it. And those flames are really for aggressive melting of the glass. But Dan has just switched his torch over to a, a flame where he took a lot of the oxygen out of it. So it's a lot cooler. And that, that flame is going to run maybe around 1,500 Fahrenheit or so. That gentler flame is better for sort of rewarming glass that might be losing a little bit of temperature and easing heat back into it. So you'll see these guys sort of going back and forth, different flame settings. There are, there are a lot of subtleties to how we set the flames, how we use the flames. Looks like Ryan has pulled a missile launcher out of the, the side oven here. And ultimately, this is going to get attached to one of the sort of the shoulders of the, the cockpit of the robot. So getting that set up to make the attachment. Looks like we have another question from the interwebs. Aha, question if this is going to be completed today. It is not. Uh, uh, these guys are, are putting so much detail into this. Uh, it will not be finished today. We're hoping they can finish it with a, a good solid work day tomorrow. And uh, since we unfortunately won't be able to see the finished piece during this live stream session, uh, once our video team has a chance to do a little bit of editing, this video will be back up on our YouTube channel for perpetuity. And we'll make sure to have uh, either some video and or some still images of the finished piece uh, attached to that video when it goes up for the long term uh, on our YouTube channel. So you will be able to see that finished piece eventually. So sort of a, a back and forth here. Want to let the piece soak for a little bit, let that heat really penetrate for a while, make sure each component is safe, then they can take it out of the, the ovens do a little more work on it. So I think uh, Adam's getting ready to remove some of the extra clear glass that might be on there and possibly preparing that, uh, that arm for attaching it to the, the bigger composition there. And of course, as the composition gets more parts attached, it becomes more elaborate also becomes quite a bit heavier. So each step of the way, they continue to sort of make their lives more and more difficult with, with each step. There, there's more at risk. There are more dozens of hours of work that go into the piece. The piece becomes more and more difficult to handle, and it becomes more and more elaborate. So there are more details to watch out for as they go along here. So some very challenging work. And these guys have been uh, managing their way through it with incredible uh, style and, and success here. It's been a blast to watch this. All right. Looks like Adam's getting that surface all cleaned up. Ah, is this going to get attached to the arm over there? Is that what's going on? Yeah. Ah, excellent. So the, the rocket launcher section that Ryan's got over here is going to get attached to uh, one of the arms as a hand for the robot.
Ryan's using one of those sort of in-between flames here, not really looking to, to melt the piece too much, but trying to soak it with heat, keep it nice and warm. Oh, looks like we got some more questions coming off of the web here. Are the arms and feet all solid? They are all constructed from solid pieces of glass. Yes, the, the only hollow tubing on the piece are the, the monkey's head, the monkey's body. There's a, a little water tank that the, the sort of upper torso of the monkey is connected to. And then there are some hollow tubes connected to those for the, the water function of the piece. Those are the only true hollow forms on the piece. Everything else is constructed of solid rods of glass or some of the, the flat panels that you see them applying here. So yeah, it's probably getting pretty heavy at this point, I'm, I'm guessing. Those, those legs are very heavy. Uh, within the feet, there, there are even little pistons attached to the feet. They left some clear windows on the sides of the feet so you can see the sort of the internal details. So a question about the, the colored glass. The, the yellow and the orange glass, they have encased in clear. So they, they've protected those colored glasses so they are not likely to, to boil them or, or burn up the color at all, which is a, a really smart way to go about it. So they, uh, what Adam was describing the other day, uh, he will stripe colored glass over a clear tube and then sleeve that into a larger diameter clear tube and uh, then they can further stretch that out, which will thin out the layer of clear over the color. So you don't really see much of the clear. You, you really have to sort of search for it. But uh, it also helps to give uh, or retain a nice glossy look to everything here. All right, so got some design discussion going on here. Dan's got a, a whole bunch of little piston form set up. Mm -hmm. How many hours in total has gone into the, this piece with prep and all? Well, this week they have been working on this piece from about 10 a.m. to 6.30 p.m. Uh, we took an hour lunch break Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. They didn't even take a lunch break today. They've just been sort of grinding away. They ate some bites of pizza in between. and. Uh, Let's see, Hoops and Rhino did, there, there must have been a, a good 10 hours of prep in, in what they brought out here. Uh, Dan certainly put in a, at least a couple hours of prep to, to get the monkey prepared. So yeah, there's, there's at least another dozen hours. Um, and if you, you know, multiply by the amount of people putting in those hours too, it, it, it's quite a lot. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised when it's all said and done if this piece had uh, and well over 100 man hours in it. So there's, there's a lot of work going on here. And it looks like we're setting up to make another big move here again. Every time I see Adam starting to warm up that graphite, I know the big piece is about to come out of the oven here. Do we have another question from the web? Or? Yeah, what do you got? Can I explain the plumbing of the piece? What sort of perk, et cetera? What do we have for a perk inside there? OK. Two, it's a, a two-hole diffy. So two holes at the, the very bottom of the, the down piece that goes through there. And we'll see if we can get a good look at the piece. It's sort of tough to see all the function because they've been building the sculpture right around it. But essentially, uh, the sort of gun that you see on top is the mouthpiece. That feeds into a disc on the back side. The disc has two drains coming off the bottom of it. And uh, everything pulls through the monkey as well. So the the 
sort of uh, the, the back of the monkey's head is fed right into the top of the disc. And there's a, a water container sort of coming off the bottom of the monkey's torso. Pretty complex. So yeah, we see these guys uh, sort of lining things up for their next move here. Figuring out how the, the arm and then that uh, sort of rocket launcher hand are going to go together here. And this is a, a big part of how this all comes together. There are a lot of these moments where they have to sort of align things, make some design decisions on the spot, figure out the angles that everything's going to really work at. And uh, an object like this, if you draw really well, sure, you can draw out all these parts and, and get it laid out on paper. But there's always going to be little tweaks that need to be made uh, along the way. There's just too many parts, such a complex object that you're going to have to sort of work things out step by step. And uh, I'm sure in many art studios, moments like this could wind up with some, some arguing or some, some push and pull. These guys are incredibly cohesive as a team. Uh, the, the level of sort of trust and understanding they have for each other has been outstanding. Uh, you couldn't ask for a, a better team of folks to work together. They all seem to understand each other's skills and, and concerns. Uh, there's a massive amount of respect for the, the skills. And uh, yeah, you're just not going to pull off this sort of collaboration without the right personalities coming together to, to do it, and, and obviously skill sets. A couple of questions off the web. Uh, what would an object, or is this object for sale? Uh, has somebody already claimed it? Not that I know of. Um, it, it ultimately, I believe, will, will be for sale somewhere out there in the market. Uh, I know there is a big trade show coming up for the the, the pipe making scene out in Las Vegas in a, a few weeks. And I know Dan had mentioned an interest in maybe bringing it out there, at least a show out there. Uh, so we don't know wh what sort of a home it will wind up in. And what will it be used for? Uh, this is a pipe that can be used for cannabis consumption. So uh, it, it is water filtered and yeah, and we'll have I would imagine uh, fabulous function to it as well. These guys are not messing around here. They've been very thorough in making sure all the functional parts are aligned just right, so it will, in fact, function optimally. And uh, yeah, there we have it. So uh, a quick little design discussion, sort of getting those parts out, seeing how they're going to fit together. We're going to leave that piece in the oven for maybe 15 minutes or so, really let the heat soak back into it, get it all warmed up so they can relax with it for a couple of minutes when they go to make their next move. And uh, just continue cranking along here. So now that they've sort of discussed how this is going to be attached and the, the different angles that, that they'll work from here, uh, Adam's going to start to build material for those attachments. Uh, they, still, they still want to get the, uh, the rocket launcher attached to the end of the arm here. I imagine they'll want to do that attachment before attaching the arm to the rest of the piece. And really, part of the, part of the, the game with process here is to pull that composition out of the oven as few times as necessary. And uh, so they try to build all these components together and then just attach the, the multiple components at once to the, the composition. So while things are a, a tiny bit quieter for a moment here, 
uh, since these guys have been at it all week and you only get to see uh, about an hour and a half of, of what's gone on, uh, we put together a, a little PowerPoint with some images of, of some of what's gone on through the, the course of the week. So I'll take you through some of the slides, uh, the sort of title slide here. Uh, this has been a very common sort of thing here where they've got different parts out all taking a peek and uh, making their next design decisions. And this was early on in the piece. Uh, I mentioned Dan had already prepared the, the monkey's head and uh, Hoobs and Rhino had already prepared uh, a whole bunch of the colored glass and got some of the, the beginnings of the structure together. So in this image, we see Dan has uh, put the monkey inside of the cockpit and Hoobs is sort of taking a look at how the, uh, the clear windshield top part of the cockpit is gonna fit on there. It's a lot of steps to things. We get a, a nice close up of Dan adding the monkey's head onto the monkey's torso. And that again is all hollow. Uh, the, the water and smoke and vapors will, will travel right through those parts. Uh, Hoobs working on one of the legs a couple days ago. And uh, you, you can see they, they started as much smaller things, far fewer details, but uh, over the course of the last couple of days, they added a ton of detail onto the legs, got the feet attached to the legs, and then attached the, the foot with the leg to the, the cockpit and the, the bigger structure. And Rhino working on one of the legs a, a couple days ago as well. And Rhino's just been sort of a, a machine down there, nonstop cranking away, making all sorts of detailed components. And uh, this is a, a very typical color palette for him as well. Uh, if you know Rhino's work at all, you, you very much know that he uh, works around these rubber ducky themes uh, a lot of the time and has really sort of developed an interesting voice uh, around uh, the, the ducks and also using the colors of, of the ducks. And here's Dan plugging away, uh, adding some of the function to the back of the cockpit. So you can see a, a nice detail of the monkey and you can see uh, his goggles on top of his head there. And he used some uh, UV reactive glass in the goggles. There's also UV reactive glass for much of the, the functional tubing as well. So when a black light is, is shined on it, uh, those things really glow a bright green. Hoobs with the, the very beginnings of, uh, that's, I believe a leg, judging by the shirt that he's wearing on that day. So that, that is sort of the interior of what these legs look like before they add all the, the different paneling to things. And Rhino plugging away, that would be one of the disc components that you see in the, the joints of the arm and also the, the, jo the knee joint on the legs. And this is what I've been coming into uh, each morning here. This would be, uh, this is probably yesterday morning, I'm guessing. So they had the, the cockpit all done. And in this image, you see the black disc coming off the back of the cockpit. That's part of the function. That disc is hollow. So uh, water and air will, will flow through those areas. You can see some of the hollow tubing feeding up through the bottom of the cockpit as well. And uh, of course, uh, the, a couple of the feet components that have the orange glass all the way on the left side of that image and the, the legs and with the yellow components attached there. Another nice shot of the, the monkey's face in the cockpit. Uh, you might notice just over the, the monkey's right shoulder, Dan even put a fire extinguisher in there. Uh, he put a control panel in front of the monkey as well that's got a whole series of buttons and controls and the monkey's holding on to his little joysticks for control in there. Yeah, and more of this sort of design decisions going on as Hoops was attaching the top of the cockpit over the monkey. Uh, Dan sort of blew me away on, I think it was day two, as they were figuring out getting that cockpit on there, the monkey was up just maybe a, a couple millimeters too high to fit the cockpit on. And Dan softened part of the, the, the water container that's just below the monkey, pushed it down just enough to get it to fit in there. So there have been all sorts of uh, amazing little 
maneuvers to, to get this all to work together. It's been absolutely brilliant to watch. And this would have been, uh, I think this is probably two days ago, or maybe it was yesterday, early in the day. Uh, so Ryan and, and Adam just sort of lining things up, figuring out how the feet and the legs were going to look relative to the, the cockpit. And uh, this is Hoobs adding on what they were referring to as the, the backpack. So this is, uh, th this has the, the actual ground joint that uh, the, the banger will be hung into. And this was a, a really good example for me of seeing how they balance their skill sets together. So I mentioned Hoobs is particularly good with uh, sort of the structural issues, and Dan is particularly good with the hollow work. So attaching this backpack section on here required making a couple of solid attachments of the backpack with clear glass bits onto the, the black disc for the function. And then, since there was a, a hollow part of the, the functional elements also within the backpack, once Hoobs got the, the solid connections done, they set the piece in the annealer for a few more minutes, and then Coil jumped in to fix and, and really attach the, the hollow form. So in these shots, you can see a little more of the function. Uh, the, the area Dan's sort of melting on the image on the left was connecting the joint that is just above, uh, underneath the backpack, to the rest of the, the water function. And uh, I've had a few people ask if ultimately, uh, since this has obviously got, got some of Rhino's color theming around the rubber duckies, people have been asking, is there going to be a, a duckbill on it? And uh, that is the, the duckbill right there that Rhino was working on uh, yesterday. So ultimately, that will wind up attached. Uh, I don't know if that's going to happen today. And then uh, towards the end of the night last night, these guys attached what ultimately will be the mouthpiece, which looks like sort of a, almost like a cannon off the, the left shoulder of the piece. So again, Dan did the, the really tricky hollow attachment. So the mouthpiece is attached to the top of that black disc. And then Hoobs came along once the, the hollow attachment was looking pretty good and added a, a couple extra solid attachments to really uh, firm up that, that structure. So, yeah, then this is what I came into uh, this morning. So they had the arms prepared partially. You see the cockpit there with most of the function worked out. Uh, and then uh, in the other annealer, they had uh, the feet and the legs set up and ready to go. And the, the center of that image on the right side is the, the, the duck bill that ultimately will end up on the front of this. All right, so back to some of the intense live action here. So Hoops has the, the piece back out of the oven. And it looks like we're going to add a, a solid piece of black glass on here that will help to uh, be part of the attachment to one of the arms, I believe. So getting that sized up just right. So all of the, the different flat glass panels that these guys have been adding on here as sort of protective uh, shields around the, the mechanoid form, they're all reinforced with multiple attachments. They've been very smart about their, their structural concerns with this piece. Everything is assembled from multiple connection points Glass is always strongest if it's really sort of bridged from multiple directions. These guys know that, and uh, they really 
make sure to, to build a, a very stable structure. There's no sense putting in dozens and dozens of hours on a piece if it's not going to really hold up for the long term. These guys are not messing around. Very well assembled. Uh, so he's sort of bridging that shield panel to the the core structure here is actually connected to connected it to part of the the hollow disk functional area. And then it's right in with a hand torch. And uh, we had some folks who were curious what type of hand torch this particular one was. Uh, this is a Herbert Arnold mini hand torch here. Very hot little torch. And just trying to smooth in those connections. He sort of got the, the piece tacked into place, but then we need some extra heat to really fuse this all together get everything to, to really flow and connect. And these are some of those moments where he's focused on really making sure things are attached and going to be structurally sound, but he's also got that sort of stopwatch going in the back of the mind, realizing uh, can't keep this piece out of the oven forever, maybe five minutes or so, and then we really want to get it back in there. And in the, the meantime, Rhino is uh, about to attach the, uh, the rocket launcher hand to the, the end of the arm. So that'll be all prepared. So I suspect Hoobs will finish up this move here. We'll probably set the piece back in the oven and uh, give it another 10, 15 minutes in the oven, and then they can go ahead and get that arm attached. Yeah, so a lot of different steps to uh, an object like this. Dozens of hours of very precise work. So if anybody does have uh, any questions as we go along here, whether it's in-house here in the amphitheater or anybody out there on the internet, feel free to chime in or type your questions into the chat if you're, you're out there on the web. We'll be happy to answer those as best we can. So flame working is uh, really a great process for this sort of detail. And uh, oftentimes, as we're demonstrating flame working here at the museum, people ask how far back in history this sort of a process goes. There seems to be this assumption as people see these real futuristic looking torches that this process must be fairly new. But it really depends on how you define flame working. Uh, if, you design, if you define it as using a focused flame to soften glass to, to shape it, well, some of the oldest pieces we have in our collections here at the museum very likely had some amount of flame working involved in them. And it would be possible to create a hot enough flame to, to melt and shape glass just with a wood fire that has enough airflow to it. Yes, another question from the web here. Aha. Uh -huh. So questions from the web. Have any of these parts been cold worked? No, none of them have. They've all been shaped hot. There's no, uh, no cutting or carving or, or faceting uh, on this piece. And then the question was the, the torch on the bench. Which GTT is this? So Hoobs has a Mirage from glass torch technology is going here. And if you're wondering about the hand torch he was just using, that's a Herbert Arnold uh, mini hand torch there as well. Is that a different tip on that than what they tend to come with? Or? Ah, OK. Nice. OK. So uh, Hoop says that he's sort of combined a couple of the, the different Herbert Arnold hand torches, putting a, a tip that typically goes on a larger hand torch on this smaller one. And uh, so he gets quite a bit of heat out of that little tiny torch there. Perfect tool for all the construction that, uh, that he tends to do to, to build these bigger compositions. 
All right. How were the colored sheet sections made? Well, to make the sheets, they have done a, a combination of things. Uh, at times, they will take hollow tubes of the colored glass, uh, open on both ends, heat the thing up so it's really ripping hot, and press them. Uh, they have some flat graphite mashers around here, so really just getting the glass incredibly hot, pressing down. When they're pressing down the, the hollow forms, they do have to consider the idea that air could get trapped in. So if it's a sealed end, they'll tend to start at the sealed end, kind of roll that graphite tool back to squeeze the air out. Uh, they've also created some of the flat sheets by uh, just flattening out solid rods of colored glass. And the clear panels of uh, flat glass that are in there are actually sheets of clear borosilicate glass, what we refer to as boro float glass. So that, that is commercially available. Hoops mentioned earlier in the week, uh, he gets that flat glass from a company near him that uh, makes dichroic glass, where typically these sheets of clear glass would be sprayed with a chemical coating that gives a, a very interesting color effect. really been blowing my mind seeing the, uh, the sort of variety of details that are going into this piece. Uh, all three of these guys have been making some really finely detailed small components like the, the section that Dan's working on here. And you see these finely, finely detailed components come together into this much bigger composition. We've got a, a lot of different approaches to hollow forms and solid forms coming together. So Rhino getting the, the gun attached to the end of the arm here, and that is a hollow attachment there. So you see he's got a blow hose connected so he can inflate the glass as he's making the attachment. As we make hollow attachments, it's very important that the wall thicknesses stay as uniform as possible. Glass is strongest if the wall thickness is uniform. So as we, we make attachments, we want to make sure they're really fused in cleanly, but uh, a little bit of uh, very uh, well, well apportioned air pressure will, will help to sort of puff out that glass, make sure it's evenly, uh, evenly formed, as structurally sound as possible. <laughs> How much will the piece weigh when it's finished? Do you have any thoughts on that, Hoobs? <laughs> He, he's thinking about 10 pounds. That is a big piece of glass. <laughs> yeah, Hoobs is uh, apparently, after making all these pieces, becoming like the, the human scale and, and understands as he's working on it what it's turning into and, and how much it'll... Wow. Huh. Oh my goodness. So uh, a couple of Hoob's recent uh, bigger constructions have been these sort of vintage cars. And uh, apparently those have come out weighing around 20 pounds each. So, yeah. wow. <laughs> hey Hoob's, how much did the spaceship weigh? Yeah, the space station. Oh my goodness. Yeah. These, these, <laughs> was a 50 pound piece. Uh, I, I highly suggest going through Hooves Instagram, at, at Hooves Glass, take a look at some of the compositional work that he's put together with, with all sorts of folks. And uh, yeah, they made a space station a couple years ago. Uh, they've, over the last couple years, they've brought a, a group together at a, a studio out in California and uh, around July 4th, work on these massive collaborations and uh, one of which was a space station a couple of years ago. And, 
27 people collaborating on the, the same object. It's unbelievable. Yeah, and he, uh, he's adapted ovens specifically to, to do this sort of work. Uh, the oven we have here, the, the door opens up. It's, it's functional. It, it works very well. But for some of these bigger constructions, the piece just starts getting so heavy, and it has some delicate parts to it. What he has developed is actually uh, a floor to the oven that is on wheels, and the floor itself rolls right out from the oven. So they never even have to lift the thing. They can just slide it right in there. I, uh, I haven't seen that in person yet, but I've seen it in images, and it, it just looks brilliant. Yeah, so custom fabrication to get the right tool for the, the right job. And uh, as, as these guys were planning to come out here, I've been sort of processing, how do we supplement that tool if they need it? So uh, there are some techniques that are used in furnace glass that could be helpful, but not quite as precise as what Hoobs came up with for his oven. So uh, I'm glad that it hasn't come to uh, us needing that equipment yet. Yeah, and these guys, uh, their initial plan sounded a lot smaller than what this has actually turned into. Aha, interesting question uh, off of Facebook here. With all of the colors and thick to thin in the works, could you elaborate on their approach to thinking about heat and mechanics of assembling such intricate work. Yeah, uh, th there's a lot going on there. Uh, so a big part of it, uh, glass making in general, is all about timing and temperature. Um, so anytime you have thick parts attached to thinner parts, thinner parts are gonna cool much faster than the thicker ones. Uh, so it is very important to balance temperature as you go along. And these guys balance temperature in either of two ways. They can balance it a bit with the flame. I mentioned earlier, sometimes you'll see these guys using the blue flame to really melt the glass and shape it. Other times you're gonna see them adjust that flame to something that's yellowy, uh, a little more billowy. So they can use that yellowish billowy flame to sort of soak some gentle heat throughout the whole piece. As things warm to the same temperature, uh, they, they sort of balance out their stress. And also they're using the oven to reduce a lot of that stress as they go along as well. So they, they let the piece soak in the oven for 15 minutes at a shot, uh, making sure it really has soaked through. That will relieve a lot of the stress. Then they can be comfortable as they make their next move. So here we go, pulling the composition out of the oven. Looks like we're ready for another big move here. I think Rhino is going to get that arm that he's been working on. Aha, so a question about uh, temperatures with the oven here. Uh, the annealing ovens right now are holding at 1,050 Fahrenheit, which is the, the annealing point for borosilicate glass, which is what these guys are working with. And we just hold these ovens at 1050 all day as they're working in and out of them. And then at the end of the day, the, the ramp down cycle that we've set, uh, they go, they, they've been holding at 1050 for an hour after they finish. They ramp down to 700 from there over about three hours. So trying to ease the glass down through what's known as the strain point, which is where the, the glass really goes through the the most intense stress of its cool down process, holding at 700 for 30 minutes, and then the oven shuts off from there. And these are well enough insulated uh, from 700 to room temperature takes probably another four hours or so. So as you start getting into such elaborate constructions, yeah, you, you do have some great concerns of thick spots cooling slower than thinner spots. You're trying to balance that out by controlling the speed at which the oven itself is lowering temperature. All right, a little more structural work here, making sure the way all these parts are sort of bridged and interconnected, that everything is well fused together. There's 
No fooling around with a piece like this. Every single attachment really needs to be perfectly sound. The, the last thing in the world you want to run into with a, a, a situation like this is you just skimped a little bit on one attachment and that could affect the entire piece. So it's always worth taking that extra five minutes, 30 minutes, two hours, whatever it is, to, to really make sure everything is sound. So I got a fresh cylinder of liquid oxygen for these guys to start the week here. And I'm awfully curious to see how much they end up using by the end of it. They, they have an interesting balance of, of sort of work process here using these little hand torches that doesn't really use all that much oxygen. So there are times that they're sort of cranking through some of the gas as they're working with the bigger, thicker uh, elements and preparing those into the, the different panels or the hollow forms. But then from there, it's, it's really uh, far less use of, of gases as they make all these attachments and do all the, the assembly. So the glove that Hoobs has on and the sleeve, those both have Kevlar fibers in them, as does that black pad that he's using to, to sort of help support the piece. So that Kevlar works as great insulation, keeps him from cooking too much as he makes these moves back and forth. All right, so it looks like Rhino is Getting some final details onto the arm over here. And just to make sure our artists know where we stand uh, as far as the live stream, it is now 4.35. So we've got about 24, 25 more minutes that uh, will be connected to the web here. It looks like Rhino's sort of setting up some material for, for bridging, so as they connect the arm, uh, they can also connect more clear glass to hold that in place as uh, they really refine the attachment of the arm to the rest of the structure. Always thinking a few steps ahead. Uh, as they make these attachments of all the different components, it's really helpful to attach those components with extra supports, or what we'd refer to as bridges. So to using clear glass to, to work as extra support so they can refine the connections. I, I mentioned earlier how they really need to make sure everything's fused and flowed together, and also uh, has curved lines where one part meets the other rather than sharp angles. So uh, it's very helpful. They sort of make an initial attachment then attach these bridges, hold the piece in place, refine the, the final attachment of the sculpture, and at the end of it all, they'll remove all that extra clear glass, get all those extra supports out of the way, and we'll be left with the, the final sculpture. Uh, I suspect that's going to be a, a big part of what has to happen tomorrow. So making sure that clear glass is really well attached to the arm. Uh, even the, these bridges, these extra support pieces, need to be attached in a, a, structural, a structurally sound manner. And these guys, they, they don't cut any corners with any of this. It's been brilliant to watch. Uh, so this is just one of the arms. Not sure what they have in mind to attach onto the other arm. I haven't seen a, another hand made yet. The, the other arm is pretty well constructed, but I think they're still sort of dreaming up what uh, the other hand might be, whether it's a claw or some sort of a weapon like this one. So we shall see. It's a, another part of what's been so fun watching this piece come together. So preparing that bridge. Uh, 
again, a, a big part of staying a few steps ahead is thinking about what's going to need to be supported when and where it needs to be supported. Uh, another big concern with all these bridges and, and all these supports, you need to be able to remove them at the end of it all. So they're always thinking further ahead, how's this thing going to come off of here too? So a lot of concerns to, to be processed all at once. Just such a fun flow to things here. Constant action with these guys. Now, I mentioned as we started the live stream that we really built this amphitheater hot shop such that uh, artists could come in here, make the most challenging work they can think of, and we would have everything they might ever need to, to create such work. Well, the next step of what I know we need to, uh, to add to our system here are more of these annealing ovens. Uh, ultimately, it would be great to have these guys come back, maybe bring a, a few of their friends with them, and we'd really love to uh, continue to, to give flame workers the opportunity to, to keep really highlighting the, the craft and, and showing what's what's possible in this realm. And, and we love to provide that opportunity for glass artists of all sorts. So just really tuning in those clear connections, making sure everything's fused well. So the, I mentioned the glass they're using for this is what's known as borosilicate glass. And a lot of folks don't realize it, but there are many different recipes for glass out there in the world, actually tens of thousands. And uh, borosilicate, was originally developed to be used for making lenses for telescopes and microscopes in the, the 1890s. And uh, the, the reason it was developed for lenses, if a lens is uh, a, a softer glass or a glass that expands and contracts more with temperature change, as you go to use it in different temperature conditions, the optics change. That lens is gonna either expand a little, contract a little, and that little bit of movement can, can really affect your optics of a, a, a telescope or a microscope. So some German scientists led by Otto Schott developed a glass by adding boron oxide to it that would not expand and contract nearly as much as most other glasses. So it made for much more effective, much more consistent lenses. And shortly after they sort of worked things out for the lenses, it was thought of that uh, this glass would also be ideal for making scientific laboratory apparatus. So all the, all the sort of different uh, apparatus you might see in a, a chemistry lab or an engineering lab. And so borosilicate glass has really sort of been the industry standard for, uh, for laboratory wear since the, the early 1900s. And it's also a really handy glass for artistic work too, since it does tolerate the temperature change so well. It is the ideal glass for, for making compositional work like what these guys are up to. And that is always a consideration for glass artists, making sure that you have the right glass for the work that you intend to make. And then from that right glass, you wanna make sure you've got a process that works for the type of work you wanna make. And uh, I mentioned early on that flame working is ideal for fine detail work and also for compositional work where you're attaching multiple components into a, a larger structure. And that tolerance for temperature change is a, a key reason why that is the case. Yeah, yeah, so a question here, 
uh, if the lenses in the, the 1800s would have been flame worked, uh, they were not. They, they would have been cast into molds and then ground and polished. Yeah. Now, one of the, the catches with flame working is it does affect the, the surface of the glass a little bit. And when you're looking for a really precise lens, to, to apply a flame to it could affect the optics of things. So uh, with a, an object like that, you're best off casting a, a boule of glass or casting a, a small round of glass. And then to really perfect the surface, you're going to grind it and polish it. And of course, uh, different lens shapes, concave, convex, you're going to sort of grind those a bit as well to get your different shapes. Uh, even if you do cast it into a shape that's close to the finished lens, it still requires some, uh, some grinding and some polishing. <laughs> Question from the web. Do pieces, people ever make pieces like this from soft glass? I've never seen anything remotely similar to this out of soft glass. Uh, I would say probably the most complex soft glass constructions that I've tended to see, uh, if you look up artists like Lucio Babaco uh, from Murano, Italy, he does a lot of very detailed figurative work that he does assemble into very complex constructions. Um, there are a couple other Italian folks I could think of. Uh, Mauro Bonaventura is another artist who does very complex soda lime glass constructions on the torch. Uh, Massimiliano Calderone would be another one. Uh, but their work tends to be a lot more on the sort of the classical side of things. Uh, not going to tend to see such futuristic looking designs from them. And uh, you're also not going to see uh, pieces like this that are also functional in the, the way that these are functional. So while it might be possible to, to make work like this out of soda lime glass, I don't know that I've seen anybody doing it yet. And that uh, also sort of relates to using the, the right glass for the work you want to make. Now, while it would be possible to use ovens and torches in a way that you could potentially construct such a thing out of a, a more temperamental glass, why, why would you bother? When you know a glass that's going to make your life a little easier in, in building those constructions, you might as well use the material that makes the most sense for the job, right? Mm -hmm. Aha, so another question from Facebook here. When making a piece like this, is it important that all the clear glass used is from the same manufacturer? Does not need to be from the same manufacturer, but it does need to be compatible. And I've mentioned a couple times how glass expands with heat and contracts with cooling. Different compositions of glass will expand and contract at different rates. What is crucial when you're combining glasses to make a composition like this is that everything expands and contracts at the same rate. So uh, while it doesn't need to come from the same manufacturer, it does need to have compatibility to the other glasses that you're working with. And if you ever uh, combine glasses that do expand and contract at different rates, uh, as you're working them. When they're molten, you might get them to stick. You may notice that one is a lot softer than the other, but they may stick. But then as they cool, they actually peel apart and crack right apart. So yeah, it's just a, a physical impossibility to combine certain glasses. Now, that said, there are times that some artists will actually physically mix different compositions of glass together in proportions. And they can sort of grade different proportions and build a, a transition of separate glasses that ultimately can connect to one another. But uh, uh, that is not a situation these guys want to get into. And there used to be some limitations in the color palette of borosilicate. But uh, really, as of maybe 10, 15 years ago, the color palette has grown enormously. So just about anything you might ever 
want to see in a, a soda lime glass color is now available in, a, in the borosilicate palette. It uh, took a while for borosilicate color companies to, to really build out a, a broad palette. Because borosilicate melts at a higher temperature, certain colorants that are used for lower temperature melting glasses tend to burn up at these higher temperatures, or they have different reactions with the boron oxide that goes into this glass. So in, in many cases, they had to discover new colorants or new combinations of colorants to get borosilicate glass into those same color families as what's available in, in other glasses. But uh, at this point, the, the color companies provide us with so much in the palette. It is just amazing. And uh, a, a big part of what has enabled these color companies to, to be so experimental and to really sort of push, uh, push their palettes so far has been the, the pipe movement. There are so many flame workers all across this country, all around the world, that are, that are now using glass to, to make functional pipes. And because of all those artists out there, these color companies can afford to experiment. They, they've got enough business where they can really broaden things. And there's a massive demand for their product. Uh, there's such a demand for their product that sometimes it's really hard for some of us to get our hands on it. And uh, we're, we're seeing with some of the collectors in the, the pipe market nowadays where collectors are actually buying colored glass themselves and then finding artists to work with those colored glasses. It, it's become quite an interesting thing. Uh, I don't think that happens in the, the softer glass markets. It's been... All right, some more questions from the web. Will there be any clear in the final piece aside from the windshield? I don't think so. I think all the other clear glass is going to get removed. Are they making the recycler drain go through the monkey head and body? It's draining through the disc, I believe. I, I don't think it drains through the monkey. Does that sound right to you guys? The, the, the drain is just through the disc and the tubes coming off the disc, not through the monkey? Oh, it does, okay. It does come through the monkey first and then, then out through the drains. There you have it. Yeah, I've been watching this whole thing as it's getting built and it has me plenty confused. Yeah, these, are, these are not the typical questions we get on our live streams around here. This is pretty fun. <laughs> it's a very different animal going on here. Yeah, that's another thing that's blown me away watching these guys develop this piece here. They know exactly what all these parts need to do, where they need to be, how they need to be positioned relative to one another, and it's just sort of an automatic thing with them. They, they, they know their subject matter so well. And uh, I, I see a lot of flame working, I see a lot of glass making, but uh, I rarely get to see this, this sort of structural work and this, this sort of uh, how, the, how the function needs to be assembled. So it's been quite an eye-opener for me. All right, so 4.52. So just a few more minutes left of, of live streaming here. It looks like we're getting these... Right, so Dan's sort of eyeing up how more parts are coming together. Is that going to be the other hand? Is that what's going on there? Yeah. Cool. All right. See, I'm starting to understand some elements of this. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, so Dan was just saying uh, <coughs> he's working out what will be the, the other hand for the, the mechanoid robot here. It's going to be sort of a claw with three sort of spike claws coming off of a, a round disc. 
So one of the hands is going to be sort of a rocket launcher. That's what Rhino's got in his hands right now. And then uh, the other hand will be a really interesting claw. And Dan's making all those <coughs> the separate claw parts all at once so you can really get them to match in size and, uh, and get them aligned nicely. Are there any metals that can be encased in borosilicate that have the same COE? I'm not sure if they have the same exact COE. That, that is a tricky one. Um, I mean, you can use things like metal leaf, uh, silver leaf, gold leaf. Those will fuse and, and be safe with borosilicate glass. I've seen people get away with attaching copper to some borosilicate glass. I think when the copper is thin enough and if you're cooling it at the right rate, you can get away with that. I don't know that the, the actual expansion rate is the same, but sometimes you can sort of coax different materials to work together, at least for a while. Yeah, I, I can't think of any other metals that I, I would really feel comfortable trying to attach. Aha, are there gonna be any detachable accessories with this piece? I did hear these guys talking about some sort of an antenna that is gonna come out of the, uh, the ground joint. So there, there will be some sort of an antenna maybe with a satellite on, on it that will be removable. I don't know that anything else will be removable though. Now that's, that's sort of all I've caught wind of so far. All right, so we're in a, a little bit of a, a holding pattern at the moment, waiting for the composition to warm up a little bit more in the oven, waiting for the arm that has the, the rocket launcher hand on it to get nice and warm. And uh, then these guys will hopefully be able to make that as their last move of the live stream to, to get that arm attached. And uh, yeah, it gives you an idea, all the, the sort of time and energy and, and consideration that has to go into a composition like this. There's no messing around, there is no rushing anything. And uh, all, the, all the timing needs to come together just right. So we're gonna let that uh, soak in a little more heat. If you guys have any other questions, this would definitely be the right time to get them in here. Dan's uh, trying to finish up another of the claws to go on to the other hand that we're working on here. And there, uh, again, timing and temperature are everything with this stuff. We cannot rush any elements. Uh, these guys already have a solid week's worth of work in this thing, so we're not messing around here. And again, uh, if you wanna take a closer look at these guys' individual work and also some of the, the collaborative things they've put together, uh, Adam's Instagram is at hoobsglass, H-O-O-B-S-G-L-A-S-S. -S. Dan is at coil condenser, coil spelled C-O-Y-L-E. And Ryan is at S-D Rhino, R-Y-N-O. So highly suggest taking a, a look at these guys' work and, and giving them a follow. Yeah, can we, uh, is it possible to type in their, their Instagrams into the YouTube? Okay. Now, Amanda, if you're listening out there, and I know you are, if you wanna put these guys' handles uh, 
into the YouTube feed, that would be great. Ah, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. When we post this, we'll try to connect some links to these guys' uh, Instagrams as well. That's been an, an interesting pace to an object like this. As we get to this point, there's, there's a lot of sort of relaxing lulls as these guys work on the the smaller detailed components, and then the. The, the sheer exhilaration when the, the composition comes out of the oven and those really intense moves need to happen. It's been quite a bit of fun to, to follow this all week here. And again, these guys will be back in the amphitheater again all day tomorrow, uh, adding the finishing touches. And then as I mentioned, all that, the clear glass rods and extra tubes will be removed very carefully. That will take some time as well. And uh, ultimately, when the piece is finished and our, our video team has had a chance to sort of edit things uh, with this live stream, this video will be back up on our YouTube channel and we'll have images and probably some video as well of the finished piece so you can all get a, a nice look at that finished object. All right, so you can tell we're getting ready for the composition to come out of the oven because here goes Hoobs heating up his graphite. We want to make sure that's warm. We don't want that sculpture touching cold surfaces that are going to suck heat out too quickly and potentially cause it to crack. Graphite is a, a really helpful material in a glass studio. It accepts the heat really well. And unlike most other materials, as the graphite heat up, heats up, it won't stick to the molten glass. Most other materials, as they get hot, will stick to molten glass. So we use graphite for work surfaces, we use it for tools, we use it for molds. All right, so there is our mechanoid. Rhino's got that arm. And we'll get this thing attached here. So one more big move to show. So just sort of eyeing out exactly where they want to place this thing before they get it molten. Now Rhino knows exactly where Hoobs want the, wants uh, the heat placed as he goes to attach the arm on here. So Hoobs is warming up that surface where this will get attached. Again, we want both pieces of glass the right temperature, so as they touch them together, they're gonna really flow together. They'll get this attached, they'll interconnect it and bridge that clear glass rod to another, another structurally sound part of the piece, and then they'll all get in there with those hand torches and really fuse and sort of clean up the attachment. So here we go, squeezing that in, Buying exactly how they want it positioned and letting that initial attachment start to firm up a little bit. It's still a little bit flexible so they can sort of eye it, make sure it's positioned just the way they want here. And then we're gonna wanna bridge that clear glass rod to another part of the, the clear structural material there. All right. So now attaching some clear glass to bridge things together. And you can see where teamwork is absolutely crucial with this coil sort of holding the piece nice and steady. They've got the initial attachment tacked together. And now to interconnect some of the clear glass hold the arm in place with the clear glass so they can go back to the, the, the permanent attachment of the, the shoulder, reheat that and really smooth in and clean up that attachment. And again, timing is, is of the essence with this. We don't wanna have the piece out of the oven for too long. So Hoops has made a, a bridge of some six millimeter clear glass rod to hold the arm into the body. The rhino just removed the, uh, the thicker handle that had been attached. So 
So Hoob's just sort of cleaning up what he just bridged. Rhino's actually holding the arm in place right now. He's got a, a clear glass rod in his hand where he's just sort of supporting the arm with his left hand, holding that steady. So now they're actually softening both of the, the connection spots. But I suspect as the, the bridge that Hoob's just added firms up, now they can both go in to that shoulder joint with both of those hand torches and really smooth that in. Uh, again, we don't want to leave any acute angles in there. We want everything really smoothed in. Uh, Hoobs is actually cooling that other connection that he had just made, the, the bridge. He shut the flame off, just turned his oxygen on, and was cooling that bit of clear glass so it would stiffen up. Now they can focus a little more on the shoulder attachment. really fusing that glass in, flowing it together, making sure it is going to be structurally sound. You're really starting to get a, a nice look at how this piece is coming together with all these sort of panels that protect the, the different elements of the, the mechanoid robot here. Our monkey pilot inside there, who also serves as part of the function of the piece. The monkey looks like he's ready for trouble, too. And for those of you who are into bonus features, We've got uh, a few different aspects of the piece that have some UV reactive glass in them. So the, the goggles of the monkey are UV reactive. You shine a black light over them and they glow a bright green. And also some of the, uh, the functional components, some of the hollow forms also are made from that same black light reactive glass. A lot of conversation going on here as well. All sort of eyeing how the, the seam is flowing together. And as soon as they're comfortable with the attachment, that piece is gonna go right back into the oven. We'll let it soak in some more heat settle some of the stress out of there, and then they'll continue to, to work away on it. All right, let's see some of the details on there. Unbelievable. All right, we'll go back into the oven here. Let some of that stress come out of there. Let the piece relax a little bit. All righty, we'll shut this down. And how about a nice round of applause for our amazing team here. Ladies and gentlemen, Hoobs, Coil, Rhino. Unbelievable work, guys. Thank you so much for coming out to, to work here. It is such a thrill to, to get to see this level of work going on right here at the museum. Thank you to all of you out there on the web for joining us. We, we appreciate you for following along. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see you next time here at the Corning Museum of Glass. Thank you, everybody.